Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening from uh, wherever you're joining. Uh, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to join the session entitled Addressing the Invisibility of Persons with Disability in S FCD Context. Uh, my name is Ingo Widofa. I'm the practice manager of the Global Unit of the Social Development Global Practice at the World Bank. It's a great pleasure for me to moderate this important session, which will, hope to, which will show how we can be responsive to recent trends and global policy mandates to promote disability inclusion in humanitarian and conflict interventions uh, across the world. Um, kindly note that during this session, international sign language interpretation and captioning services will be available. Um, I would this, uh, this ask the speakers uh, to please slow down a bit with their, with their interventions so that it's easier for the sign language interpreter to follow the discussion. So, uh, disability in FCV contexts. Uh, by 2030, up to two thirds of the world's extreme poor will live in countries characterized by fragility, conflict, and violence. The global fragility landscape has worsened significantly over the last 10, 15 years. There are now more violent conflicts globally than at any time in the past 30 years, and the world is also facing the largest forced displacement crisis ever recorded. The objective of the recently launched World Bank's uh, FCB strategy is to enhance the, the World Bank's effectiveness in supporting countries in addressing the drivers and impacts of fragility, conflict, and violence, and strengthening their resilience, including for the most vulnerable and mar marginalized population segments. The recently established social development global practice has also developed a strategy which highlights the importance of people-centered and inclusive development, including for persons with disabilities, of course, as a cornerstone for successful and sustainable development. It, this strategy also stresses the importance of resilient communities and empowerment, empowered citizens in advancing the development process. Persons with disabilities face heightened risks of violent attacks, forced displacement, abandonment, inability to escape, and ongoing neglect in situations of fragility, conflict, and violence. They may also be at greater risk of personal violence in conflict situations due to their disability. For example, women with disabilities are at a greater risk for gender-based violence in such contexts. The purpose of this session is to highlight the gaps in development programming that exacerbate the vulnerabilities experienced by persons with disabilities in FCV situations. Barriers and risk factors that may exclude persons with disabilities from critical services will be discussed. And most importantly, examples of good practices will be shared to ensure that the needs of persons with different types of disabilities are considered fully throughout the development programming, planning and programming and, and evaluation cycle. Um, this morning, we have with us uh, a great uh, set of panelists, whom I will now uh, introduce well, one by one. First, we have um, Nilafar Bayat, uh, who was born and lives in Kabul, Afghanistan. Nilafar was injured by a rocket blast when she was two years old, partially paralyzing her legs and impairing her mobility. In 2012, Nilafar became one of the first female wheel uh, wheelchair basketball players in Afghanistan and she is now the captain of the Afghanistan Women's National Wheelchair Basketball Team. She works at the International Committee of the Red Cross's Orthopedic and Physical Rehabilitation Center in Kabul and is an outspoken advocate for female and disability rights in her home country. We also have Jess Markt, who is the ICRC's Disability Sports and Inclusion Advisor, leading the organization's efforts to create a sustainable programs focused on breaking down the stigma of physical disability in countries dealing with the effects of war and conflict around the world. Jeff has worked with the ICRC Physical Rehabilitation Program since 2011 to build and develop wheelchair basketball and other disability sport programs in more than 20 conflict zones worldwide, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Palestinian territories, and South Sudan. In addition to his work in sport program development, Jess also leads ICRC's efforts to stimulate economic integration opportunities for persons with physical disabilities through its career development program. We then have Jeff Meir, who has since 2015 been the Executive Director of Humanity and Inclusion, a US uh, nonprofit based in, in Maryland, which is part of the Human, Humanity and Inclusion Network. HI assists people with disabilities and other vulnerable people to achieve their full potential. Among the organization's areas of, of interventions, they emphasize our global health, including rehabilitation, inclusive education, inclusive livelihoods, inclusive civil society, and inclusive social participation. 
Previously, Jeff served as the Special Advisor for Global Health Policy and Development at the Public Health Institute, and he worked for Planned Parenthood of America as Director of International Advocacy. Rama Mustafa represents the Sudan National Union of Persons with Physical Disability. Rama holds a master's degree in law, uh, an LLM in International Comparative Disability Law and Policy from the National University of Ireland, Galway. Rama has, an extens has extensive experience in the humanitarian field and mainstreaming disability rights and public policies and programs. He has worked for several agencies in Sudan in the field of disability inclusion, including the Bridging the Gap 2 project with the Italian Cooperation Agency, the British Council, the International Disability Alliance, and the AD International. Rama is also an outspoken advocate for the rights of disability, persons with disabilities in her country. Uh, I will now proceed with two rounds of questions for the panelists. Uh, and after that, we will also have a, an opportunity for meet other meeting participants to ask questions for Q&A session with the panel. Um, so without further ado, as I, I'll move to the first set of questions. Uh, the first one is, is for you, Jess Markt uh, of the ICRC. The, internet, the ICRC has a long experience uh, in working in, in, in conflict zones across the world. Last year, the ICRC and the Geneva Academy launched a new research report on the situation of persons with disabilities, international humanitarian, uh, inter international humanitarian law and the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in states experiencing armed conflict. Could you, Jeff, please share with us some of the main findings regarding the key challenges faced by persons with disabilities in armed conflict settings? Over to you, Jeff, please. Yes. Sure. Thanks, Ingo. Are you able to hear me? I can hear you and see you. Please right. go ahead. So the, the research reports uh, for which the ICRC served on an expert panel, um, an advisory board, found that of the nearly 1 billion people with disabilities around the world, which constitutes almost 15% of the global population, they, of course, face marginalization in all contexts around the world, but this marginalization is exacerbated significantly in countries dealing with fragility, conflict, and violence. Um, the report found that this uh, is reflected in three different sort of phases of conflict. During the conflict itself, as populations are fleeing conflict in their countries, and then in the post-conflict and the aftermath of, of war and conflict. So some of the examples that the, that the report came up with where people are most profoundly affected, um, people with disabilities, are that they're more likely to be killed or sustain serious injuries as a result of accessible protection, protection mechanisms, uh, including advanced warnings that are not tailored to people with disabilities. Also, inaccessible evacuation procedures that don't take into account uh, a variety of different impairments, um, including the ability to access transport or emergency information. Uh, it also noted that there is, among women and girls, as you mentioned uh, in your introduction, an increased risk of sexual and gender based violence. Um, there uh, is also the issue of destruction of infrastructure and assistive devices, which create further physical barriers um, to education, employment, and other, other necessary aspects of society, particularly for people with physical disabilities and mobility impairments. Um, the fact that um, humanitarian assistance is also often not tailored to be accessible can create massive health complications for people dealing with a variety of different disabilities as well. So it points to the necessity for humanitarian organizations like those participating um, in this forum to ensure that all their services are tailored to be accessible to people with different types of disabilities. Um, I think the, the broader context is also reflected in the fact that people with disabilities generally are uh, are not able to access their basic human rights um, under IHRL and IHL, um, and that this also needs to be ensured throughout any conflict zone, and, and all parties to conflicts need to be aware that, that people with disabilities need to be reflected in their, uh, their 
sorry, their um, recognition of international humanitarian rights law and international humanitarian law. Um, I think to sum up, um, people with disabilities are also often seen as passive victims um, in situations of conflict and not reflected as empowered in agents of their own change. Um, and so the sort of um, unofficial motto of the disability community, nothing about us without us, applies here in the fact that as programs and, and regulations are put into place reflecting people with disabilities in FCV context, the people that need to help drive those regulations and laws forward need to be from the disability community. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, the next question is for uh, Jeff Mir. Um, Jeff, globally, there are about 80 million uh, refugees, internally displaced persons, and asylum seekers who have had to flee their homes to escape violence, conflict, and persecution. Humanity and inclusion works in more than 60 countries and has done research on their situation, uh, on the situation of refugees, in particular with disabilities. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found from that research and the situation of persons with disabilities as, as and displaced persons globally? Yes, of course. Uh, thank you, by the way, first to the Fragility Forum and the World Bank for asking me to represent humanity and inclusion today. My name is Jeff Meir and I'm the US Executive Director. And Ingo, thank you for the lovely introduction. We all know that people with disabilities confront multiple layers of discrimination. Refugees also face discrimination, but combined, those two uh, stigmas make refugees with disabilities even more vulnerable than other groups. Of course, right now, most refugees are also facing the additional threat of, that comes from the coronavirus. I spoke this week with a colleague in Yemen named Ahmed who confirmed to me that discrimination is affecting people with disabilities greatly in his country. Many do not have access to hygiene due to a lack of financial resources or information. He told me what, that when uh, refugees with disabilities are in need of help, many people refuse to help him because they fear persons with disabilities are, in his words, sick or dirty. This is a dire picture. Humanity and Inclusion works with refugees with disabilities in Kenya, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Uganda, Colombia, Lebanon, and Jordan. For one recent report, we spoke with refugees to understand their situation under COVID, and we found a disturbing and universal sentiment. The response to COVID is actually no different than the response to other stressors. People with disabilities are being left out. If anything, their exclusion is worse than it was before the pandemic. We've previously found that in situations of conflict and persecution, the prevalence of disability is actually higher than the 15% that the WHO estimates is the global average. In fact, for example, in the serious uh, case, we did a study that found that when mental health issues are included, more than 30% of refugees and displaced people uh, qualify as, um, uh, as living with a disability. When the COVID crisis uh, spreads deeper into communities, we see a very rapid rejection of refugees, especially with disabilities. People who live close to refugee camps avoid the people with disabilities, deny them access to services like healthcare or transportation because of fear, because they fear somehow that people with disabilities will put others in danger. In addition, we know that refugee camps are generally not built for, pe for uh, prevention of COVID. Hygiene conditions are already quite precarious in many places. Access to clean water and soap, which of course are some of the basic tools that we use to fight infection in the case of the coronavirus, uh, finding those can be a struggle. For example, uh, we heard uh, the, uh, last month from a, a mother in Kenya with three children who has a six-year-old. One of them, uh, Arua, has, uh, uh, was born with a disability that limits her mobility. Her mother told us that when they came to the camp 
uh, from Sudan in 2014, they used to get water, but now water in the camp has become almost impossible to get. There are shortages every week. They have to, in fact, go to a neighboring camp just to get clean water. People with disabilities we know are also facing information challenges. Um, in Rwanda, we, uh, some of our staff recently visited the Kabiza refugee camp and found that um, those with uh, difficulty uh, speaking and hearing had extreme trouble accessing accurate health information about coronavirus. Um, uh, lockdowns have also hurt the ability to transmit accurate health information and uh, have stopped, in some cases, humanitarian services entirely, including the delivery of basic aid. Yet this is what refugees and people with disabilities living in these camps depend upon. Uh, services are becoming more difficult to access. Rehabilitation uh, has been interrupted, which of course is disastrous in the case of long-term rehabilitation work. Mental health care becomes almost impossible to access. Family planning, maternal ch and child care, even clinical management of cases of rape and gender-based violence become extremely difficult for refugees to access. Um, healthcare workers are restricted in their travel and uh, uh, COVID-19 really has swamped the care of a lot of other uh, uh, illnesses and problems that occur in refugee camps. I also think it's important to mention the socioeconomic risk of people with disabilities living in refugee camps because they already faced barriers accessing the informal and the formal economies. In the case of COVID-19, the lockdowns have disproportionately exposed people with disabilities to loss of income and food insecurity. Many find that they have to turn to negative coping mechanisms to address these challenges. So we have come up with a, 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 a theoretical framework that we're using, and I'll describe that a little bit later. But in our work in the refugee camps today, we are trying to collect and analyze and monitor data about refugees with disabilities disaggregated by sex, age, and disability. We are designing and sharing information with other actors. And as uh, Jess mentioned, we always keep in mind the principle of nothing about us without us. We make sure that people with disabilities and OPDs, the, uh, the organizations of persons with disabilities, are involved in every stage of our planning and relief. Thank you. Thanks uh, very much, Jeff. And yes, I mean, clearly the uh, one would expect that the COVID stress, the COVID situation and the additional stresses that that's placed would further exacerbate many of the um, existing uh, already inequalities in our resources. Um, it'll be interesting, I think, perhaps uh, later in the talk to go through a bit, few more of the implications of that. Um, let me turn now to Nilafar uh, in, in, in Kabul. Um, Nilafar, conflict and disasters increase the vulnerability of persons with disabilities of all ages and gender, but it's known that, that it disproportionately affects women and girls. Um, based on your experiences, what would you think are the greatest challenges for women with disabilities in FCV settings? Mm, as I think, uh, living in Afghanistan is not easy. Uh, for a woman, it's uh, dangerous. But for a girl with disability, it makes several all the challenges. Uh, we have too many big challenges, like uh, we don't have the basic human rights all the fun girls that they have disability, I speak about. Uh, if you see the girls that they go to school or university or doing basketball or maybe other sports or they are active, it's just about the city, uh, like Kabul, Herat, Mazar Sharif, or, or, or just few cities that um, they, uh, they, they are allowed to go to school or do uh, b uh, basketball or sport or some other activity. Um, but in all Afghanistan, there is two or three uh, uh, centers like ICRC, Swedish Committee, or others that they have uh, three services for the uh, for people with disability. But there are not good university or school or uh, shopping center or restaurant or many other 
places to be accessible or uh, people with disability can, can use. Uh, it's like that. And also the girls with disability mm, doesn't have, still they couldn't achieve the right, uh, the equal that other people have, like, like men in Afghanistan. Um, or um, every day I'm working with ICRC. I meet more than uh, 11, 12, or sometimes 20 women and uh, girls that they have disability, they come to uh, our hospital and I see hmm, most of them are not going to school. Or maybe sometimes I ask them to join our team. We have basketball team or football. Uh, when I speak with them family, uh, they shame. They, they feel like when they have disability, uh, it's, it's all. They have to stay at home. Or, or uh, when someone is visible, all the mind is all like this. But, uh, the, the biggest problem is that uh, all the girls with disability cannot go to school or cannot do store or cannot go to university. This is the biggest thing. And also um, the society. The society still, still is like before that they think uh, when they are girls and when they are visible, they, they have to stay at home. They have nothing to do. Uh, like when I came to from Bali to Afghanistan and we were the champion, uh, I saw a man that he came and said, oh, excellent, you played very good, you're the champion, but uh, you played so strong like a man. He never told me that you are a strong girl. It was, it was hurting me. Why? But I said, I want to be like a strong lady. I want to be a strong girl in Afghanistan. It's not always like this. Do you compare me with the strong women? Man, it shows that still we are the second gender. But with disability, we are the third gender. And uh, it's really, it's not easy in Afghanistan to deal with this all. But now uh, in Kabul or some other, a little changing. Uh, I'm happy with this. I'm really happy. I'm working on this. I'm speaking with too many families to allow them girls and daughters to uh, to let them go to school. Or um, I speak a lot with uh, families that allow them to come and play with me. There's a lot of girls. But um, like my brother, still, uh, he's not so agree with this to Milofar be famous. Or all Afghanistan know even my name. Or see me in social media. Uh, but fortunately, I have a nice father that he's always supporting me. I hope it, it happened to everyone in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilo Fine. I think that really goes to the point about the importance of also looking at norms and values and cultural values and how to, to help to shift those in this process of disability inclusion um, as we think about how we can try to make a difference in, in supporting persons with disabilities in such environments. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn now to Rama Mustafa, who is with us, uh, who is in, in Sudan. Rama, the previous panelists have discussed the various challenges faced by persons with, disability, with disabilities in, in FCV contexts. Can you tell us a little bit about the key international and regional agreements and give us some examples of those which are which protect the rights of persons with disabilities in FCV settings. Hello. Uh, international setting. We'll start with the rights of ability. I am shifted up based upon ability. Uh, disability. conflict. Eleven. This can you meet? This two. They make is to the criterion A. Ending of the accordingly must be taken. 
section and should be said violence. Attention uh, is to this force by international um, the most when they are very sustainable and the plan or to live in inclusion of being human a fair but peaceful society and would provide for all active contributions the life frame the risk that aims and that are to this organized critical of the group. All these are policies and includes from decision made based on information. This age. Which is this for me as of how they and I. The four IAS can include the activities, action, aim to essential that must take identify to the needs to the materials, placing center of both. And as member of the village, is a pretty cause of protection, disability, and humility. Nine, is it a for the of It counts with over the force and conflict and with this proposal to address the bike phase, including taking measures to ensure access to assist and basic service provided in the context of armed conflict on an equal basis with others. Also, uh, it helps or uh, building the capacity and knowledge on disability rights uh, and needs uh, across UN skipping peace building actors. These are the most relevant international persons with disabilities in uh, fragility, conflict, and violent setting. Thanks very much, Rahma. Um, and I'll come back to you maybe at a later point with a couple of questions on on implementation challenges um, around these. But thanks very much for providing those frameworks. Um, let me move on, I think, to the second round of questions at this point. The first one uh, in, in this round would go to Jeff Mir. Uh, Jeff, could you give, share with us some of the examples of the projects and good practices that humanity and inclusion has implemented support the inclusion of persons with disabilities in FCD settings. 
Yes, of course. Thank you. I have a number of examples that come to mind, but I, I thought I would mention, Ingo, in this context, the framework that HI has put into place uh, specific to the COVID pandemic, um, which we are calling Basic Service Access for Everyone, or Be Safe. It has four main pillars. The first, of course, is to support the health response to contain the virus involving prevention, awareness raising, hygiene promotion, uh, distribution of hygiene kits, soap and disinfectant products. This is a very uh, straightforward type of intervention, but it is turning out to be incredibly complex for some of the reasons that I discussed earlier. The second component of Be Safe is managing the social impacts of the pandemic, identifying the people who are most at risk and referring them for services, meeting basic needs through food distribution, cash transfer, or income generation, and of course, protection of the people most at risk and working with them to meet their mental health needs. Under the third pillar, we're improving access to essential services, particularly using our existing capacity in logistics. We are trying to make all of our services more inclusive by awareness raising among other actors. The final pillar, the fourth and final pillar for Be Safe has to do with advocacy. We are collecting testimony and data about how the pandemic is affecting people with disabilities in fragile circumstances. When we talk about uh, what we do in the field, uh, one example that comes to mind right away is from the Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya, uh, which uh, together with Dadaab houses about 80% of Kenya's refugees. Recently, we began a two year project in these camps with assistance from the State Department's Office of Population, Refugees and Migration. We are using their funds to support refugees with disabilities living in the camps. We have worked to provide rehabilitation, physical rehabilitation and mental health services, psychosocial support. We are providing assistive devices and mobility aids such as wheelchairs, crutches, walkers and hand cycles to allow people with disabilities uh, to independently move throughout the camp. And we're also bridging the gap between the refugee communities and the local communities. Um, for example, in uh, Dadaab, if uh, Nilofar had found herself in our camp, she might have enjoyed a training for refugees and host communities with coaches, including people with disabilities and people from the local community together in team sport. In the first year of this project, we assisted about 13,000 individuals. And in March of this, by March of this year, we had assisted another 3,200. We've also helped people in these camps raise their voices and become involved in their own camp coordination. People with disabilities face barriers in doing this uh, because uh, they, they often are not able to attend the meetings uh, because of transportation problems or uh, other access issues. And so we work with them individually and in groups to make sure that they have the tools and ability to participate effectively. Um, in Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Thailand, we're just finishing a five-year project uh, that we got support from the IKEA Foundation in, in uh, 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 Norway. Uh, it's been fantastic because it gave our teams uh, five years to plan and implement ways of improving the lives of children with disabilities especially children with disabilities in these camps. Why do we do this? Well, for example, in the Mei Li refugee camp in Thailand, 40,000 refugees share one soccer field. One 10-year-old uh, told my colleague, uh, who was the camp director there, that kids had absolutely no place to play and didn't even have toys. There's no place in the world where children should not have access to places, safe places to play and toys to play with. We know how important it is to children, uh, to their child development, to their well-being. It helps them learn, helps them uh, raise their self-esteem, and uh, imparts important life skills. Together, they're enjoying uh, with their uh, uh, able colleagues, uh, able uh, neighbor children, a range of playgrounds and toys that are accessible to all of the children. And we're very excited about that. We've done a similar project in Bangladesh with uh, Rohingya refugees. 
uh, which includes people with injuries uh, sustained in, in uh, fighting um, and other uh, physiological and psychological trauma. Uh, we're making that all children with or without disabilities have access to education. We have assisted more than 30 schools that uh, work with Rohingya children, training teachers and making the schools accessible. Sometimes the simplest remedy can be the most effective, adding a ramp to the front of a school so children with disabilities with mobility uh, challenges can access the school can go a long way. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories comes from I, I who's 50 years old. She's chairperson of the self help group of people with disabilities. She explained to me that before COVID-19, she could move around freely within the camp to offer peer support to other refugees with disabilities. They had monthly meetings to share information and so on. But then there was the lockdown and the lockdown changed all of that. The camp committee did not allow her or any of her colleagues to move around and suddenly she was stuck. But she knew that advocacy could help. She explained her situation to us. We worked with the camp authorities and ultimately worked out a solution to allow her to pursue her work. Uh, with social distancing, wearing masks, and access to hand washing. What I, I said, I'd like to quote, she told me that persons with disabilities should never be abandoned. It is my duty to support them and I will never stop. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff, and also for that great story there uh, at the end. I, I was in, is a Rohingya refugee, I presume, in, in Bangladesh, is that? Correct. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I will turn now to Rahma um, uh, for a bit more on this and how uh, basically, the, uh, Rahma, the question for you is based on your experiences in, in Sudan and elsewhere. In your view, how best can development organizations such as uh, your multilaterals and the World, World Bank most in effectively engage with persons with disabilities or and or with organizations that represent persons with disabilities to ensure responsive and needs based program design and interventions. Rahmat, are you there? Do you hear me? You may be on mute. Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, oh, there we go. Perfect. Thanks. Go ahead, please. Uh, consult. Is autonomy is just about people will restore a full life. Okay, she's the same. It will help you. Is important working as a monitoring comes in that also to give patient uh, opinions. Uh, Direct for us of the make disappear formation foundation also. Like, I see the 
in language and breath communication. So but to make decisions, make use family, dependent, rest, or the disease. What and how so is so we a meaningful of need to build partnership and collaboration with organization of persons with disabilities that represent a wide range of uh, uh, constitu constituencies, especially the, uh, those who are often underrepresented, like women, indigenous persons, persons with psychosocial and intellectual disabilities. Uh, the, uh, this would be better to address the multiple and intersecting force forms of discrimination they face. It is necessary to take measures to ensure that persons with disability receive the necessary support, uh, fund, encouragement to be part of the decision-making process, especially in the absence of representative organizations. Creating opportunities for strengthening and empowerment of persons with disability and their organization leads to meaningful participation. Also, we need to conduct continuous monitoring and evaluation of the functioning of participation of persons with disabilities at local, regional, and international uh, uh, decision-making process. Uh, consultation with organization of persons with disabilities should be based on transparency, mutual respect, meaningful dialogue, and sincere aim to reach collective agreement on programs that respond to their, their, their diversity. And uh, such process should allow for a reasonable and realistic timeline, take into account the nature of organization of persons with disability, which often depend on the work of volunteers. Uh, to conclude, I can say that participation of organizations of persons with disability require planning, budgeting, uh, to adapt the physical environment and communication to ensure accessibility and also require provision of reasonable accommodation. The staff should be also trained uh, to address attitudinal barriers that often present and deeply rooted in communities. Thank you. Thank you, Rahma. That's a really nice comprehensive, comprehensive, I think, overview of how how development partners should be thinking about engaging with persons with disabilities, including anywhere, I would think, but certainly also in such environments, in FCD environments. Um, I'll turn now to Jess Markt. Um, Jess, in your work uh, as a sports and disability inclusion advisor, can you give us a, a tell us a bit more about the power of sports in fostering inclusion and the well-being of persons with disabilities, uh, including in FCD settings? Uh, I think the the true power of sport is is multifaceted. Um, so when we implement sport programs, um, the first thing we're looking to do is just drive societal and social integration of people with disabilities that maybe have never been given the opportunity to have that sort of interaction um, based on their societies and cultures. And so from that, um, participants are able to build confidence and feeling that as they progress through their, their process in learning a sport, that they have a personal definition that is something other than being a person with a disability. And what we see is that as these programs advance and as these participants are able to play at higher and higher levels, that sort of self-conception starts to become more as an athlete first than as a person with a disability first, which is the definition that they have always been given by their societies and their communities. So with that sort of personal evolution, and I've seen so many incredible transformations 
be on these programs. Um, what we then start to see is a transformation in the way societies look at people with disabilities. So instead of being people with disabilities as objects of pity or charity, um, or even looking at them through sort of what we call the medical model, um, they start to see athletes like Nilofar on television playing at a very high level, whether it's in her country at a national championship or whether it's in an in international competition representing her country with the flag of Afghanistan on her back. And suddenly, she mentioned in her opening comments, as a hero, she came back from her first tournament as a champion from uh, after winning a tournament in Indonesia and was greeted by news crews that were broadcasting the arrival of the female Afghanistan national basketball team all across Afghanistan, was then given the opportunity to have tea with her team and the first lady of Afghanistan in the presidential palace. So through this sort of iterative process, we start to see a transformation not only of the people who are having the opportunity to play sports um, in their personal conception, but also a transformation in how our societies view them and include them. Thank you, Jess. And and maybe I will uh, at this point then turn to Nilafar for her kind of perspective on this. Nilafar, as as a, a high level athlete, what has sport meant to you personally, and what do you think are the positive effects it can have for for other women with disabilities living in fragile contexts such as Afghanistan? Um, of course, as uh, all my friends and family and everyone know that. And now basketball is the important part of my life. It changed too many things in my life and the other girls that they are doing basketball with. Like uh, on 2018, uh, the government of Afghanistan has selected me in the list of top 10 ladies that they are inspiring and working in Afghanistan activity. And on uh, 2018 and 19, uh, two years, uh, MBC of uh, USA in Afghanistan has um, uh, written about me that Nilo Fari is the um, active girl in Afghanistan. Just all about uh, basketball and sport dates with me and so other girls in Afghanistan. Uh, like I have a good friend from the first day I started basketball. Uh, she's Fadwana. She was before as Fadwana was at home, not going to school, or she had a very deep depression, as uh, his mother knew, and now I know him. I know her better. Um, with basketball uh, and with the sport, um, she started uh, her school. She graduated. And from uh, 2019 and up to now, uh, she's working with an NGO. She has a big team. And now, uh, basketball changed my life. Like, now I have enough confidence to speak about the rights of girls with disability or all the people with disability in Afghanistan, uh, I can lead a big team. It's not, it's not uh, I think, a small thing in Afghanistan for a girl. Uh, and um, I have a lot of friends. And uh, now, uh, when the people see that I can do too many things, or the girls that they come uh, and see me in a hospital or in uh, our gym in uh, during the sport time, when they see they feel uh, like they can do also. It's not a different thing. Or it's not a hard thing to, it's not difficult. Uh, Cause I, uh, I registered too many girls in our sport uh, uh, department for basketball, football, and now they are happy. And in Afghanistan, when, um, when we came for the first time back to Afghanistan uh, from Bali with the championship, uh, after that, too many people came and understood, oh, no, that there is a team that they are disabled, they are doing basketball. Basketball was so, basketball was not so famous uh, before that. And when they saw that we are the champion and uh, how we make them feel proud, uh, most of them come and uh, uh, supported us. And also, it's, it's like uh, my mother was thinking, a little bit different with my my sport and so uh, some of my relatives. When we came back from Bali and Indonesia, they told um, 
it's a big job. You can do many good things like this. It's, uh, my mother told uh, now I'm really happy to allow you to go to school and university and you do sport. And um, I think when uh, people in Afghanistan look at me and other girls in the provinces that they are doing basketball, uh, they realize that it is also the girls' right to, to have the freedom to do sport, to go to school or university. Mm, I know it's the first of way. We have uh, a long way to work on that, to uh, make people to um, accept them daughter or equal to them son. And uh, sport changed too many things in Afghanistan. Uh, with sport, we are union. With sport, we, we, we feel proud. With sport, we don't think about other things. With sport, when we are doing basketball in a court, we, we forget that we are disabled. Just we think about the, the hope or the, uh, for our future we have, about the goal that we have for the future. Mm, and sport uh, could make this to make the people of Palestine uh, more united with everyone, with each other, I mean. Thank you so much, uh, Nila. It's, 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 I mean, great to, to hear, I mean, both the, the power of sport, both, I think, for personal transformation, but then also, in a sense, for opening up other spaces, so giving the confidence to move into areas that you would otherwise probably not have thought of. And I think, you know, serving as a, as a unifier uh, yeah, uh, for, for a bigger community. Just like this, when we so. see the other team, before we didn't know that how um, ladies are strong in other countries. When we go out, we saw that, oh, ladies in other countries are working so much hard. They are, they are so happy with them, what they do. They are working a lot and uh, they are making them country proud. That's why when we came back, we, we started to, to fight against this all. The, to, uh, to, uh, we also have our own rights or to uh, allow other girls to join the society and, uh, and do sport. Okay, super. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me turn now uh, over to, to Caroline to see if we have any questions for the panelists from the, the, the audience. So, uh, and to give a bit of space for that. So, over to Caroline. You can continue a little bit more. I don't think we have any questions yet. Okay, good. No questions can have come in yet. Okay, good. Then, I mean, let me um, um, come to this question. Maybe, maybe uh, both Nilofa and I think Jess touched on it. This question of um, how to approach, uh, approach. I mean, in this case, it was sports to that, that helped to shift uh, norms and 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 uh, the that can help to shift norms and values, views of women, but also views of persons with disabilities and obviously there's an, and, and the intersectionalities there. I'd be curious to hear from um, Rahma and, and who brings more of a kind of legal view to this, how she thinks that, the, as it were, the sort of legal side and social interventions can work together uh, and to complement each other. Um, and then also perhaps to hear from Jeff, Mia a little bit on how they, their work tries to, the work of, of um, uh, their work works on issues of, of norms and values in the programming. So over to Rahma first and then to Jeff. Uh, excuse me, can you repeat your question? Yeah, so Rahma, you've you've you listed for us. I mean, you worked. That we've kind of in this in the panel. We've talked at different levels. I think of engagement, right? Your your initial your inputs have been very much on the the legal side, and then on stakeholder engagement. Um, I was curious whether you had any thoughts on how development programming could try to mo help with shifting norms and values uh, around disability in different cultures in different societies. Um, in addition, uh, and how you can translate the legal kind of norms and you know the international legal standards or, or in, uh, into 
local norms and local culture most effectively and your experience with that yes they should operate in raising awareness about the disability rights and changing the norms and cultures uh, and attitudes uh, towards persons with disabilities the organization of persons with disabilities uh, are led and controlled by persons with disabilities who are, have lived experience and knowledge uh, about their rights and needs so they will be in a better position to raise awareness about uh, the disability rights and uh, uh, made, uh, make the change in the cultures and uh, the, the views of the, or the opinions towards persons with disabilities using, uh, using the legal framework and the provision of the international laws uh, in this regard. Thank you. Um, maybe then turning to Jeff very briefly, this question of, of educating folks on their rights and, and, and uh, well, the rights uh, in, in in development programming or in your programming is that something that 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 you factor into your work? Yes, thank you. That's uh, that's a brilliant question, and and we we absolutely consider the individual and their uh, own view of themselves as an essential part of what we work on all the. We also work. Uh, Sorry about the noise. We, we work extensively at the community level as well, because we know that enhancing the community's ability is also an important part of this. We work with leaders and we work at the national level. So it's really a four part intervention strategy, but I agree 100% that the self esteem of the individual, the awareness of the individual is at the root of all of our intervention. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. So I have one question from uh, from the floor, as it were. Um, we know that in, in fragile conflict settings, there are often periods of intense adversity and stress, and the impact of that stress can accumulate and can result in, in PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Can, uh, can one of the, can, well, actually, Jeff, well, since I have you on screen, maybe you could say something about how this uh, impacts uh, the ability of oh, persons with disabilities, whether that's different, and and how one can uh, work with them on the on that dimension uh, of the challenge. I think it's very important for us, and it goes to the question of mental health, which has not always been forefront in the in the study of disability. But I think that as we know more and more about PTSD and fragile circumstances we find that the, the uh, in fact, the majority of cases of disability uh, relate to mental health issues. I mentioned earlier the case of Syria, where we noted that um, the, the, the incidence of, of disability when you include mental health um, issues rises to double the worldwide average. I, I think that would be a good general guideline for fragile circumstances in general. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thanks very much uh, for that, Jeff. Um, I think we're on the hour, so our time is is up. Um, unless we have any more questions, Caroline, did anything else come in? If not, then I then I will move towards closing. So first. Let me thank uh, the, each of the four of you very much for your time and for your really great insights and guidance on how to think about uh, and approach and address uh, disability inclusion more systematically in, in, in the programming of development uh, engagements. Um, I think starting with uh, you know, the legal frameworks um, then on to the normative and, and cultural variables, um, the value, the, the importance of kind of both, uh, if you like, the, the harder interventions around infrastructure and the basic access 
um, then thinking through services, um, and then the the more social interventions like sports um, in in such a process. I think really great great uh, you know, contributions in, from from all of you. Um, I think it certainly helped. I, I hope it's helped the participants to improve their understanding of the differentiated and discrete risk factors and vulnerabilities experienced by persons with disabilities in FCV environments. Um, and the, I think to help deepen our understanding of the impacts also of FCV situations on persons with disabilities and, and how those are discrete and different um, and need to be thought about separately. Um, and then I think to also learn a little bit about the potential good practices or development actors, things to think about, things to be doing, and of course, the importance of engaging with persons with disabilities and their organizations in uh, programming, planning, uh, implementation and evaluation throughout the whole process as active contributors and stakeholders in the process. And I think in that context, um, Rahma's point about the fact that this this is not a nice to have. It's actually uh, fundamental to the rights of these uh, of persons is key. So rights based approaches in that uh, in that story. Um, and finally, um, yeah, I think the, the yeah, no, the value of of listening, listening carefully, listening consistently to persons who have the lived experience to make sure that what we're trying to do um, is responsive, addresses needs and makes a difference. Um, so with that, um, let me conclude. Uh, thank you very much to the four panelists, um, Jeff, Jess, Rah uh, Rahma and Nilofa for taking the time and joining us this morning. Um, thanks to all of you who've joined and, and listened in. I hope it's been educational uh, and, and, and interesting for you. Um, and, and thanks uh, to the FCV group for sponsoring the session as part of its uh, events this year. So thanks very much to everybody and have a, have a good day. Let's welcome. Thank you.